You allowed up here? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this is my buddy Cholula, and this is Cholula's roadmap to success. Now, she is a happy girl, um, unless she sees a dog that she doesn't like, and that's why we have the video above. Um, but let's go through a quick summary of the video that went over. She's not even over. Um, so we started off by going over, uh, she got into a fight with a buddy of hers. And so the first thing we actually started talking about is dog's energy level and, uh, and uh, a treat out. Now, I like to consider dogs having 10 levels of energy. Zero to 10 is as crazy as you've ever seen your dog. Yes. So when the dog passes level five, 50% of the energy range, no matter what they are doing, we really would like them to get a break. Now, if she's playing with another dog, we'd like to interrupt that play, but the problem is she really wants to play with the other dog. So I'm gonna demonstrate, if I can, what a treat out is. So I have a treat here, and I'm gonna have a treat in each hand, and I'm just gonna to toss a treat there. So I come up behind the dog. Yes. Yes. So I have a, hand, a treat in each hand. I grab her by her thighs, and whichever direction she turns and looks, I flip that hand over, let her have the treat. The other treat goes behind it, and I'm luring her away from the other dog. Now, if you're doing this as a dog play, part, uh, play date, the other guardian should be doing that with the other dog as well. It's not fair to have one dog in a treat out, time out. We call it a treat out, so it's a positive. Because um, that uh, just kind of creates some issues. When dogs play, they do the same thing they do when they fight, only the energy level is lower, and they do take some turns of doing some subordinate things like lower, laying on their back. So if you allow two dogs to play too, wrong, too long, often and at too high of level of intensity, that's when fights can, uh, play fighting can actually turn into real fighting. I think that might have happened. Uh, now we also have to be aware of our environment. Now right now I'm mic'd up so I don't have to talk very loud, but across the street or across right next door there's a house that's going through construction. We filter out that hammering, the sawing, and all the rest of those sounds. But if she's around that all day long or she's playing outside and she's hearing that stuff, that can cause her a little stress and anxiety. And so always be aware of your environment. There may be other things that we're desensitized to as humans that actually can contribute to a dog's anxiety level. So, um, so basically watch that energy level when she's playing and, uh, and just don't let her play too high level of intensity. Now, when you're in the home, the treat out that I showed you earlier is something you'd want to practice when there's so if she just gets used to this feeling, turns around and I got a treat, I, I gypped you, I didn't have a treat there, but I got a treat here for you. So she gets used to it. that pressure feeling on my thigh means if I turn around, I'm gonna get a couple of treats. We do that independent of the other dog. So then when we're doing it, when there's another dog and we do that, she turns around and she's happy. Her emotional response is positive as opposed to a negative. It's not a loss to the dog. Um, okay, so uh, that's a treat out. I have a video for that if you, yes if you need help with that one. This is what I just did right here, it's called celebrating. So every time that a dog offers a behavior that we like, yes, I'm gonna say her marker word and I'm going to reward her. Um, I didn't ask her to do these things. Now, I should certainly mark and reward when I ask her to do it if she does, but the more that we reward our dogs for desired behaviors, the more likely they are to engage in those behaviors. Most of us give our dogs the bulk of the attention for doing undesired behaviors. Barking, lunging, jumping up, no, stop that is like giving your dog a treat. All attention is rewarding for dogs. This is how most of us actually accidentally train our dogs to do the exact opposite of what we want to do. Celebrating is a great way to undo that. So I didn't ask her to sit, I didn't ask her to lay down, and she's about to lay on her side and I'm gonna reward her for that as well. So every time that she does something that I want her to do and I pet, mark, and reward, that makes her more likely to do that in the, in, in the future because it's reinforcing, which is really a key aspect of how dogs learn. So uh, instead of giving attention for things we don't want, we're gonna give her attention to things we want. After a while, she starts start coming and sitting down in front of us to ask for that attention. Now, when you do notice that she does something near your partner and your partner missed it, you say celebrate and your partner says yes and pets her. I don't need to know what I'm petting her for. You saw it, I trust you, I'm gonna take your word for it. Now, I want you to be mindful. So if you see her, just like I just did a minute ago, she comes to you, she sits, she lays down, she gives you eye contact. Does something cute like lays with her feet like this, mark and reward that. I taught my dog to stretch this way on cue. Every time he stretched, I said yes, petted him. And after a while, if he was about to do it, I'd say stretch, and he would do his thing, waggle his butt, and stand up and go, Bruh! and he would do it 10 times in a row on cue because I waited for him to do it, and I just sell it, marked and rewarded after he did it on his own. And when I anticipated he was going to do it, I said the cue first. Remember the cue, the four components, cue, the command word, the action, 
sitting. Uh, the marker word to let the dog know that they did what I want, and then a reward of either a pet or a treat. But when we teach a cue, we actually do the first, the cue, last. We just lure the dog into position until it's easy to do so. You shouldn't say the cue unless you're 90% certain that when you say the cue, the dog is going to do the action when you say it the first and only time. If not, you should just go back to using your marker word. And that's actually one of the first things that we went over in the session was doing a marker word loading exercise. The guardians here have been watching my videos, and so they're already farther ahead, but they didn't do the loading. That's a classically conditioned response. So to load it is really simple. All you got to do is just say, yes. Give the dog a treat. They don't need to do anything. And then I would walk around the place. I like to use about six to 12 treats, maybe about six to eight times until when I click or mark where the dog picks up and, is, and we've created a positive or a happy emotional response. Then I can start using the word. When she sits, I say yes and pet her. If I to sit she sits I say yes and pet her and give her a treat after a while that marker word becomes very powerful because it makes it very clear for her that she did the thing that we want without any ambiguity you don't have to worry about that I'm mic'd up that it won't even cover in that um, so uh, so yes and I did that right there for just coming even though she only came um, so the more that we reward for things that we like the more the dog will offer those particular behaviors now there's also something called uh, manners that I like to call like right now she's kind of demanding treats sit yes that was really technically outside the two second window I usually apply but makes good footage so we'll go ahead and go with it so she was nudging my treat pouch if she nudges pause for attention barks She's demanding the attention, kind of like a little kid saying, Mommy, I don't like this dinner. Go make me some chicken nuggets. So you can give her an, uh, a do-over opportunity. Down. Yes. If she does it, then she gets the attention that she's asking for. You're going to say your marker word, then give her the attention. If she doesn't do it, just lean back. Go back to making some art, watching TV, um, you know, uh, checking your emails, whatever it is you were doing before. So I said, if you do this, I'll give you a reward. And if you don't want to do it, that's totally cool. I don't care. I'm just on the next thing, she's missing out. This motivates her next time to want to do that because she wants to get that attention or affection or whatever it is. Um, and those are the watch words. Uh, the watch word I use for that one is manners. So somebody points to me say manners and the dog's jumping up on me, I would stop, tell her to sit or lie down. If she does it, say yes, pet her, and then I could tell my partner, I actually did it right and you missed it, but thanks for reminding me. And if I point at my partner and say celebrate, again, yes, and pet the dog. We also went over uh, dog cutoff signals and body language. Um, so if you watch it, well, I don't think you'd see it in the video, but um, uh, we want to remember the best place to pet her. She prefers it on her, on her neck, essentially. Uh, she liked this better than on top, but um, really the, you might want to also try, she's got a harness on it right now, but try her right or circles on her chest. A lot of dogs like that. So cutoff signals for dogs include lowering their head, turning away, flipping the ears back, a combination of all three of those or parts of those, um, looking at you from this, uh, refusing to look at you, looking at you through the white of their eye. We call it side, uh, we call it side eyes humans, but dogs, we call it whale eye. Um, refusing to come, refusing to look at you. Um, licking the lips, yawning can be signs of stress and anxiety. Burying the teeth is a pretty obvious cutoff signal. Um, uh, uh, moving away from you cut, could be a cutoff signal. Um, not engaging with you could be a cutoff signal. Rolling over their belly could be a sign of submission and kind of a cutoff signal as well. So remember when you're going to pet, uh, anybody wants to pet her, just say, hey, uh, can I pet your dog? She's so good looking. Yeah, we just ask people to hold their hand out first to see if she wants them to pet you or, or you to pet her. So I'm holding my, uh, my hand out. Yes. So she finally touched me. So if I hold my hand out, the dog doesn't touch me. It turns away. It's saying, I'm cool with you not petting me. I'm going to respect what the dog says and not pet the dog because it's communicated. It doesn't want, I don't want to be forceful of my, even though I mean a pet is a good positive thing. It's how she interprets this that, that matters. So when you're out and about, people want to meet her, just ask them to hold their hand up. She nudges their hand, then tell her she likes being scratched on her, on her uh, neck. And then they'll do that. Otherwise, they'll pat on top of the head. And if you catch yourself going like this, just immediately stop and go roll right underneath it. And again, you can pet her here and work up. Just try not to just go straight over the head. Um, let me see. Um, and if you get somebody who's adamant and they have to pet her and they're not listening to you, step in front of them. A little white lie and don't do this if your dog actually has it. But you can say, oh, you know, you can't pet her. She has a ringworm. It's contagious for humans. Nobody's supposed to touch her. They'll like take a couple steps back and give you a dirty look. 
that's fine because they're not listening to you and you just don't, your job is to look out for your dog. Now, if your dog does have a ringworm, don't take it out. It is highly <laughs> contagious uh, to be a responsible dog guardian. But the idea is um, if you provide her with a safe environment, she doesn't have to worry about it herself. So um, we talked about dog body language. Remember, um, dogs are normally wiggly and jiggly. So if your dog goes from wiggly and jiggly to stiff and, and still, that's a pretty big warning. Going from an open mouth to a closed mouth can be a warning. The ears flipping back can be a warning. Um, so again, when I read dog body language, I kind of look at components of the dog. I first look at either the tail or the head. Is the head tilted upward or is it tilted down? Is the dog licking its lips? Refusing to look, is it, are its eyes giant, unblinking saucers with dilated pupils? When dogs are feeling good, they give you what we call sleepy eyes, kind of squinty eyes. That's a really good body mechanic. Um, so is the dog nose tilted up, confident, insecure, is tilted down? Um, and so learning to read those can really help. Is the dog leaning towards something, leaning away from it? It's got one leg way out behind it, or is it leaning towards you? Leaning towards you is probably... Dog's really aggressive, got to be aggressive about giving a cutoff signal. Is it breathing heavy, holding its breath, or breathing normally? Is it drooling? Um, and then the tail. Is you know, the tail tight and stiff and quivering, or is it kind of waving back and forth? Is it unspooled? So remember, the way to read this is look at those different components. Um, but when she's relaxed, what are her ears doing? How is she holding her head? Open and closed mouth is going to vary based on the temperature and exercise and stuff like that. Eyes, are they big, hard eyes? Are they softer eyes or are they squinty eyes? Um, so if you can, and right now her tail's nice, it's relaxed. So when she's in a, in a positive mood, you know, she's happy in the house, look at all these elements and see how, she, how they're, she's carrying herself. Then when she is fearful, look at those same elements. How do they differ? When she's reactive, how do they differ? Now, sometimes when they're reactive, we don't have time to think about that. Um, if you can, one of you, maybe if you're holding a leash and you're doing it, maybe you pull out your camera and you're filming the experience. You're letting your handler handle everything. So, and then you go back home and you can watch on your big screen uh, that you got from Amazon. Um, but you can watch on your big screen and you get to play it back in slow motion. See, oh, you know, before she lunged, she did this with her eyes. She did this with her tail. Her ears did this. Her head did this. And then she lunged. So now when I'm out walking her and I see uh, another situation that might provoke a response, I'm looking for those tells. The more that we can provide her with a safe environment, the less she has to. Now when dogs nip, bark, or whatever, they're trying to get the thing to move away. What are they trying to do? Increase distance. So if we get our dogs used to increasing distance by following us away from the scary thing, she doesn't have to ever offer any cutoff signals. Well, or she probably offers a cutoff signal, but we recognize it and then move her away so she doesn't have to take it to the next level. So uh, be a good uh, observer of your dog's body language and kind of learn how to read that and move her away as you need to. On walks, um, uh, the tip for loose leash walking, have a treat with you in your hand at all times and have a bag of treats. So every time she looks at you, yes, and hold the treat out, she comes over to you and gets that treat. And then you have, grab another treat. She looks at you again, yes. What if I give her like 50 treats on a walk? Then you use kibble. That's for feed or less. That's totally fine. I know a lot of trainers that don't feed their dog out of bowls at all. All the food comes from working. Nothing wrong with that unless it's a puppy. You want them to have it food, food for fuel to build. Um, but that's a nice foundational thing for loose leash walking. Um, every once in a while, once a block, I would recommend you do a find it game. So, you know, show her that you have a treat. Say, find it and throw it in the grass. She finds it, it do that five or six treats. And then walk again. For the next block, find a nice grassy area, do the same thing. So every block you do this at least once. She's ready for this game. Then, if you turn around a corner and see there's a Rottweiler that she doesn't like, and it's turned a corner, it's coming towards you, she hasn't saw it yet, you sow this and throw the treat behind her. She goes over there just like she is right now. You redirected her away, and then you do another find it, another find it, and now you're walking the opposite direction. You prevented her from needing to correct or make that other dog go away on its own because you increased the distance. Um, now, right there, she gave me a subtle cut. She pulled away. And I, most people are like, but I'm going to keep on paying you. She says, no, I'm going to listen to what she's saying. Those cutoff signals are really important for you as well as other people. Um, okay, so uh, let me see. What else do we go over? Um, for feeding, I would recommend uh, you getting a snuffle mat. The one that I like is Runda. It's, I think, either R-H-U-N-D-A. It's different than the one I showed you in the video. Basically, it's got a band around it. It's, tr it's rectangular shape. You can hold it upside down. All the, ta all the tassels go down, and then you flip it right back up, and you rain waterfall the kibble in it. The kibble falls between there. She's got to use her nose to find it, then work and lick that thing up. And then do that again for two, three, four hundred pieces of kibble. This makes sh feeding her like a short walk. 
Um, I would also get a uh, the Tricky Trainer Omega Treat Ball, or it's a Tricky Omega Tricky Treat Ball by Omega Paw. Um, get the large one of those. And also you can look for the Sir Wobble Lot, uh, the Wob feeding thing. It looks like kind of the Weeble Wobble. Um, it's about this big. You put a kibble in there. Uh, I have one that's like a UFO that's kind of like two dishes together. Um, and uh, so different, I don't like the puzzles where it's sliders because most she's a, probably a pretty smart dog. She figures that out pretty quickly. But a ball always rolls a little bit different. So if you feed her out of those things for meals, that's a nice way for her to practice uh, or to deplete some energy, uh, feel good because she earned her food for herself and all that fun stuff. Now, uh, some pregnancy stuff, and I'll, if you remind me after this, I'll share the article that I wrote about uh, where it has all the stuff in. But start putting the baby butt paste and whatever on you. One day you do this one, next day you're doing uh, you know, a rash ointment or whatever. There's all this stuff that we use for babies that are smells. So if we can introduce them to the dog before the baby comes, that helps the dog feel more comfortable and confident. I would also, when the baby comes the first night, have them get a white towel, a clean towel, wipe the baby down, not with afterbirth, just wipe the baby down, put it in a Ziploc bag. Then whoever comes home, wash their hands first, have treats in one hand, take the, zip, uh, the bag out of the Ziploc, let her sniff it. If we know the baby's name, we could say Zelda, and she sniffs it, and then we take it away and give her a treat. Zelda, so now we're introducing the, dog's uh, the baby's name and smell to her without the baby actually coming in the house. By the time the baby comes, she has now a positive res emotional response to the baby. Um, I would recommend that you have practice going into the baby room with her outside of the room. Now, I didn't get a chance to demonstrate this, but what I do is the lines right here, I uh, tell her to sit. She's sitting outside the boundary. I take a step backwards, facing her. Half a second, take a step right back towards her, say a mark word, and we give her a treat. We're marking her not coming towards you. Then I repeat that three or four times. Then I can either take two steps back after she's gotten a couple practice, or I can take one step back again, and now I can wait one second. Then I come forward and say a mark word and give her a treat. Then two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. Eventually I'm taking multiple steps and I'm sitting down. Then we turn away from the door, it's gonna be harder. So just break it down to small steps. But eventually we get to the point where you can sit on that rocking chair and your partner's in there with you and you guys are spending some time in there every day and she's practiced sitting right outside with the open door and getting treats and you can give her a lick mat or some stuff like that but it's really at this point just having her conditioned we're just going to go in here you can see the door's open there's nothing to be worried about but you're practiced at doing this so when the baby comes and we do this that's what your normal routine is um we i'd also recommend getting an analog a little baby fake baby and start carrying it around you know especially when you come through the door um, when you're in the carrier. So getting her used to that and also seeing how she interacts with that while well, it's an analog. So if she does something that might cause harm to the baby, we know about it now without it actually causing harm to the baby. Um, getting her some exercise the days uh, that the baby comes home uh, or baby arrives before it comes home, maybe it's in the hospital, having your dog walk or take her for a walk a couple days. When dad comes home, dad's gonna be emotionally recharged, especially if mom is spending the night at the hospital. So dad's in a distressed sort of thing. So if I've gotten some nice exercise, it can help me feel a little bit better and more comfortable. And then when the, ba the day the baby comes, have your dog walker engaged to be here, not to watch your dog, walk your dog, to watch your dog. And if she needs to, she can take the dog out for a walk. But that way you have your relatives and people come over. You don't have to worry about her. Cholula is taken care of. We got a handler specifically for Cholula, and we've prepared her. Um, there's, pro there's other uh, baby, I was going to say baby making, uh, baby trip tips, but I can't remember them right now. So remind me, I'll share that article with you. Um, let me think, what else? Um, anything else we want to go over? Um, a couple th more things for, I remember for the baby. I would get her used to a dog bed now. And you might want to think about not letting her on the furniture. When you have baby time, it's an intimate time for mom and the baby up here. If Chalou's used to being on the furniture, she's going to want to get in on that too. And so help prepare for that. Having a dog bed is a great way, that, uh, place for her to be. Um, get a bully stick, drill a hole through the end of the bully stick, and then put a zip tie it to a dumbbell on the on the dog bed. Only place you can chew it is on the dog bed. She's chewing to go to the dog, choosing to go to the dog bed. Good things are happening when she's on the dog bed. When the baby comes, if she goes to the dog bed, nobody is allowed to touch her. We can call her off. The adults can, but we're gonna let her have a safe place. 
fight or flight response. So if she doesn't want to deal with the baby, she goes over there. Now also, when the baby's crying or whatever, don't watch her. She might be stressed out with the baby crying. You guys will be stressed out a little bit too, but she didn't make the baby. And so give her the opportunity to go to your bedroom in the other room and relax, excuse me, relax. Giving her some time, even when the baby, especially when the baby's walking around to, to herself can help. Also giving her a place where she can get away from the baby that the baby can't get to. I've seen people use the actual kennel, some sort of a, uh, you know, elevated hole in the, you know, in the door that they put in wood so the dog can jump through it, the baby can't reach through it. That way the dog can get away from the baby, which it's gonna need to do. Um, now, the video that we did above about the engage, disengage, and those sort of tricks, you hear, I don't know if you can hear it because I'm mic'd up, but we have a leaf blower going on. Be mindful of your environment. That sound of the leaf blower can actually cause some stress and anxiety for your dog. We filter that out. We don't think about it. But for her, that can cause the tipping point. Um, beeping trucks, crying baby, um, construction, just busy traffic, skateboarders. Skateboarders are kind of jerks. So, uh, no offense. But <laughs> that's kind of the punk motif. Um, but again, those are things that can, that can uh, contribute to a behavior issue that we don't really recognize or feel or think about. So keep, a, keep that in mind. Also, we talked about exercise. Um, remember, you can use exercise to set her up for success. Um, the dog guardians here are doing a good job of exercising her, but there's other things we can do, like playing fetch with her is a great way to play. I forgot to ask, do you guys play fetch with her? She like to play fetch? So, so when she's playing fetch, build in some impulse control for fetch. She comes, she bring, does she drop the ball or you have to take the ball out of her mouth? Okay. Now when it comes to toys, sometimes the dog just wants to show you what I got. Kind of like you have a new car. You don't want all your neighbors to drive your car. You want your neighbors to see you driving your car. And so sometimes the dog just wants to show you what I got. Sometimes they do want you to pull and take it out of my mouth and play a game. Sometimes they want to come and give you their special toy because they love you. So it can be three different things. When I'm playing fetch, I want the dog to come over and just drop it. So when the dog comes over, it's got the object in his mouth. Instead of taking it out, I just hold the treat to their lips. As soon as they drop it, I say, yes, put the treat in their mouth. Then I pick it up and I say, sit one time. If she sits, then I say yes and I throw the ball as her reward. If she doesn't sit, then I just lean back and we don't play the game. Um, so I'm going to build in a little bit of impulse control in a game that she really likes to do. So now she practices a little bit of that and there's a reward. So she's happy, you're happy. You're developing a good skill set. You might find that a certain number of fetches before a walk can produce a much better walk or before a guest comes over or whatever it is. So there might be a certain number of fetches. Tug of war is a nice way to play, energy, uh, play. but as soon as your energy level gets level five, we drop it, we stop playing the game. She can also have a doggy backpack, which is probably helpful because when you're out and about, she can carry some, some, uh, some baby supplies and you don't have to carry all that extra stuff. And you're going over, you're pulling diapers and you know, wet wipes and all this stuff out and Chalula's doing a job. She would love to be able to help you. Most of us, we don't tell our dogs what they can do to help us. Chalula, bring me a diaper. That's a great job and that's a great helper. Um, also, um, let me see, um, uh, get, uh, get the stroller. When you get the stroller, start walking her with the stroller that's empty. That way she gets used to walking with that stroller. And also you have, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I would give her a sign on right side or left side. Does she have a right side or left side that you walk her on? Left. Always on the left? Okay. So there's no right or wrong when it comes to walking your dog in the right or left. But if you walk the dog on the right side all the time and she doesn't know where to go, she will walk, go to the right side. That becomes her deployment. So I'm trying to block a little bit of the uh, deal. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Up. That's fine. I'm mic'd up. I'm pretty sure it's fine. Um, but this guy's very determined with the leaf lower. Um, so the idea is to just, again, to make sure that we're setting her up for success by helping her practice. Most people, when it comes to dogs, they don't actually teach the dog how they want it to behave. We try to teach them how to do it in the act of doing it. But there's a meme that says emergency is not uh, time to practice and practice should not be an emergency. So the more prep work you do for her now, the better equipped she is later, like going for walks and having her walk on the left side with, that, uh, with the uh, stroller so she kind of knows and is accustomed to using that. Um, and then, you know, every once in a while, stop, tell her to sit and stay, and then go mess around with the fake baby in the stroller. Yeah, you saw that person there, huh? Um, uh, so that way she kind of gets used to, because if every once in a while the baby's going to be crying, you're going to have to stop and adjust the sunscreen or whatever it is. So practicing that as realistic as you can can be really helpful. Dan? Yes. Um, okay. Um, let me see. There was something else I was going to go over. Um, 
Loose leash walking, just, uh, I think I already went over the treats with the loose leash walking. I'm trying to think, is there anything else we want to go over? Yeah, I think just the aggression of the dog. So the dog reactivity stuff, which would be in the video above. Um, and then the last thing, the last little tip for the dog reactivity, we often take it personal. It's like somebody cuts you off in, on the 405. They're probably a ding dong. They're not paying attention. They're on their phone and they don't even know you were there. So when she's doing these things, she's not doing these things to, to anger you or frustrate you. She's in an emotionally charged state of mind. Try not to take it personally. I know it's kind of hard, but dogs aren't intentionally trying to get, make you upset or frustrated. They're just trying to do whatever's natural for them. So when your dogs are doing that, that's why it's helpful to practice when you're mindful of your for practice as opposed to kind of accidentally stumbling into it. So again, you might want to start practicing, driving north of Montana and finding a nice walking route so you have one kind of lap, lap laid out beforehand, especially when you have the stroller. We don't want to have her being reactive when we're on a stroll. Um, we want to work on that when we have time, when we don't have the baby with us. Uh, and that's the stuff that's going to be encapsulated in the video above. Uh, but again, having her practice being in that neighborhood can really help because it's just uh, comfortable and normal and you'll kind of figure out a route that you want to take her on. Cholula. Oh, we went over cookie in the corner as well. I, I keep on remembering all this stuff as I'm about to wrap it up. So cookie in the corner is the one where I was throwing those treats. I have videos for that. If you want that uh, to do that, let me know. But I want you to Google scent games and find three or so scent games that you can play in the house with her uh, so she's using her nose. So this way, come on, come on up. That was kind of a fail. Come on, come on, come here. There you go. Um, and so... Uh, uh, you know, find a couple of free scent games so that you can get her to uh, burn some energy in the house without you needing to do it. Last thing I was talking about is the pause interrupter. That's also something she responded well to. Yes. So what you want to do is have a handful of treats. It's loading exercise. And just walk around your house doing that. So now when she's about to do something you don't want, let's say she's sniffing the trash. I go, she looks at me, I go, touch. She comes over. Touches her, touches her hand, you've redirected her away from whatever it was. Now, that's a really a powerful thing because, like I said, a lot of us accidentally train our dogs to misbehave, and we don't want to do that. All right, well, this is my buddy Cholula, and she is a pretty girl, isn't she? Um, her mom's not very happy with me because I told her she can't do some things with Cholula, but they're going to adjust. Anyways, this is Cholula's roadmap to success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it. <laughs>